Good morning. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Church of Kent. I am Reverend Stephen, minister of this congregation. It's good to be together once again. Thank you for joining us this morning as we gather both in person and on Zoom, a spiritual community seeking to be diverse and inclusive as we inspire love, work for justice, and grow together in community. We extend a special welcome to our visitors. Thank you for worshiping with us this morning. If you're here in person this morning and have a joy or a sorrow to share during the service, please fill out a yellow card and give it to an usher or bring it up. If you're on Zoom, you'll be asked to share joys or sorrows using the chat box. It takes a team to put Sunday morning together. So I want to thank our music director, Katie, our accompanist, Vanessa, the OK Corral, our worship associate, Randy, our religious education leader this morning, Amanda, our ushers and greeters, and our tech team. We have Jen, we have Lois, our tech manager, Julie, and our administrator, Mary Beth, who prepared slides. Thank you all. We seek to be welcoming and inclusive and practice radical hospitality. It's one of our highest values. So in that spirit, each week we take a few moments to say hello and check out check out, check in. <laughs> it's going to be one of those mornings. <laughs> check in. <laughs> okay. With each other in breakout rooms and in person. Let's do that now before I put my foot in my mouth again, okay? <laughs> to enter into this time of community once again and to invite the Spirit to be present among us and open our hearts to life and the gift of this day. Come. Let us worship together. value for that which you can contribute to those who own you. You live with the daily fear of being beaten for no reason, even to the point of death. 
The scars on your body can prove it. Sometimes dying seems like a viable option. For years, you've started working in the fields at sunrise after a sleepless night on a dirt floor in a small wooden shack with no running water. Your food the night before was not even suitable for an animal. You arrive in the field tired and hungry. You're being guarded under the watchful eye of the overseer, and you're beaten just simply because you're a slave and you looked at the overseer a wrong way. You're treated as their chattel, not a person. And as a woman, you live with the fear of being raped with no remorse by the rapist or ramifications for the rapist. Where it is, there's a way out. There's this talk of something called the Underground Railroad helping slaves escape and make it up north to freedom Although if you escape and captured, you risk being killed by the fugitive slave hunters. But what do you choose? Stay and be beaten to the point of death on the plantation or run and risk being killed. But this talk of freedom, freedom, oh, just the word itself soothes the aches, the pains, of a soothing balm all over my body and soul, freedom. Do you run? Do you stay? Do you try to escape? It's going to require you mustering up a lot of determination, grit, and courage to make it, but freedom. What you going to do? As Unitarian Universalists, we light a flame within a chalice to unite us in worship, to remind of our ongoing search for the light of truth within us and among us, a light to guide us on our journey as a community toward freedom, and a reminder that we are all interconnected in the great web of existence of which we are each a beloved part. This morning, as Meredith comes to light our shared chalice, I invite you to light your home chalice. And please join in reading the proposed eighth principle there in your bulletin. We, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and our institutions. I would like to invite the young and the young at heart to join me up here for a story. The illustrations will be up on the monitor as well, but if you're up in the front rows, you might want to take a look at the book. Hello, hello. Good to see you all. So our story this morning is called Beacon to Freedom, and it is a story of a conductor on the Underground Railroad. So uh, this book, Reverend Stephen bought when he did some traveling and visited the Underground Railroad Center in Cincinnati, correct? Yeah. So it's a pretty, uh, pretty amazing story. You can see some things happen in there. Beacon to Freedom, the story of a conductor on the Underground Railroad by Jenna Glatzer, illustrated by Ebony Glenn. In the early 1800s, when John Rankin was a boy, slavery was legal in most of the United States. Some white people owned black people and treated them as property. John's parents thought that that was terrible. How can anyone think that owning a person is acceptable? His mother questioned this. 
People like her who fought for the end of slavery were called abolitionists. You've heard that word before, yes? So they spoke out in public. They published newsletters and books. Many of them helped enslaved people find safety. John became an abolitionist. He grew up to be a church minister who believed slavery was against God's wishes. Being an abolitionist was very dangerous work. Escaped slaves and those who helped them faced punishment, sometimes even death. It took courage. That's our monthly theme. But John had strong beliefs and a strong heart, and he had a bright light that gave people, that gave people hope and showed them the way to freedom. The African slave trade to America started in 1619. Black men, women, and children were kidnapped from Africa, shipped to America, and sold like cattle. They had no rights. Families were often split apart. Some slave owners whipped their slaves to keep them in line. It was against the law in many states to teach enslaved people to read or write. Slave owners feared that education might cause trouble. John Rankin grew up in Tennessee in the late 1790s. So that's quite a long time after that started. After marrying and becoming a minister in 1814, he moved to the neighboring state of Kentucky. Both of these states allowed slavery. In Kentucky, John tried to get slave owners to set their slaves free. He urged them to listen to God's word. He wanted them to understand that it was wrong to own another human being. But the slave owners said no. They needed slaves to do their field work. Without slaves, they said, their farms would lose money and fail. John's beliefs weren't welcome in Kentucky. At times, he feared for his safety and the safety of his growing family. But people were more accepting across the river in Ohio. Ohio was a free state. That meant that slavery was against the law there. John and his wife, Jean, moved their family there in 1822. The small town of Ripley became the Rankins' new home. Has anybody ever heard of Ripley? After a few years, the Rankin family moved again. They stayed in Ripley, but they moved to a house on the hill overlooking the Ohio River. So that means it's right down, right on the river, the very south border of Ohio. If escaped slaves, could cross the river, which ran between Kentucky and Ohio, they would be on free soil, but crossing was very risky. They had to swim or row a boat in the dark of night so they wouldn't be seen. If they were caught by slave catchers, they could be beaten. Not only was it dangerous to try to escape, it was also dangerous to help anyone trying to escape. John and his family did it anyway. They gave people food and clothing. They hid them in their barn. A trapdoor in the barn floor covered with hay opened to a larger hiding space. Even though Ohio was a free state, some people there wanted to own slaves. They were suspicious that the Rankins were helping escape slaves, but they couldn't prove it. They said horrible things to John and his family. They threw rotten eggs and stones at them. That was pretty gross, right? Every night, John lit a lamp in one of the front windows of his home. He left it burning all night so people seeking freedom would know where to find him. The light shone to toward the Ohio River. It was a beacon of hope. The glowing lamp in the window of the Rankins' home helped many enslaved people find the courage to escape. They faced great dangers because they knew they would be safe once they got to that house. But not every story on the Underground Railroad had a happy ending. Some runaway slaves did not get caught before they, did get caught before they made it to the Rankin house or after they left. Sometimes people left their spouses or children behind and planned to return for them later, but that didn't always work. One man rescued his wife and children but was then tricked by a slave catcher pretending to be a friend. The man was captured and shackled. Posters started appearing that offered a reward for capturing or killing John. Slave owners from Kentucky were furious with him for helping steal their slaves. Slave catchers often snuck around the Rankin land at night watching for runaways. 
John feared for the safety of those that he was helping, but also for the safety of his family. One night, the Rankins fought off men that started a fire in their barn. John, after that night, John warned off any future intruders. John and his family continued their work with the Underground Railroad right through the time of the U.S. Civil War, which was in 1861 to 1865. For more than 40 years, the lamp at the Rankin House had glowed through the darkness. It had helped nearly 2,000 people find freedom. Yeah, so that's a pretty amazing story, right? All right, we're gonna talk a little bit more about some of those things we can find the courage to do. It took a lot of courage on John's part, a lot of courage on the part of the people who were escaping for their freedom too. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in our classes. We take time each week to care for our spiritual lives and for one another. So we create some time for shared stillness together in which we can pray or reflect, offer gratitude, meditate, or just simply be in order to remember who we truly are, reflect on this mystery that is life, and reconnect with that which we hold to be sacred, the very heart of life itself. Let's enter a time of stillness now together. I invite you to return as you're ready. Our lives bring many things, including struggle, sorrow, and loss. We're taking time now to share the struggles, the sorrows, and losses that are in our hearts. If you're on Zoom and have a sorrow, loss, or struggle to share, please use the chat box. We hold Lori in our hearts as she recovers from surgery on Friday. We also hold Sally in our hearts hearts, she'll have surgery again this week. And we remember her sister Emily as well in Germany who fell and broke her hip recently. We send wishes for healing to both of them. Elaine shares that she's dealing with recurring back issues that are limiting activity. We hold her in our hearts and send wishes for healing. If there's anyone in your heart or mind this morning that you're thinking about, you're welcome to say their names out loud now. Judy says she's thinking of the many who are still trying to flee north to freedom and a better life. <coughs> Colin shares that he's struggling with mental health and it's been difficult lately. We send wishes for your healing as well. Let's enter now into a spirit of prayer and reflection. A spirit of life the love that holds us, in which we find strength and common purpose. We turn our minds and hearts toward one another as we hold in this circle of care and concern all who need our love and support, those we've named, those who are in our hearts and thoughts, for those who are ill, those who are in pain either in body or in spirit, those who struggle with addiction. We pray that they will find healing and wholeness. We hold up those who are lonely, those who are grieving, the victims of any kind of abuse. May they find comfort and peace. We remember this morning the 21 million people across the world who are trapped in some form of modern slavery. And we pray that as each of us faces life's challenges, losses, and struggles, we will find strength and hope in knowing that we are not alone, that we are held by love itself, a love that embraces us and sustains us. May we also remember how we are intimately connected in mystery and miracle to one another and to all of life. And may this knowledge guide us in living lives of compassion, kindness, and love. May it be so. We've had moments of joy, wonder, and awe this week that have lifted our spirits. Once again, if you're on Zoom and have a joy to share, please use the chat box. Heidi and Randy spent a beautiful day at Pennsylvania Park with their son Connor and grandson Rory. Oh, wonderful news that soon there will be a second grandson. <laughs> Congratulations. And 
Raylin shares that her group raised three hundred dollars for not sure what that is, but oh, for, for choir. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> Collins shares the joy of finally getting to meet his niece this week. And we rejoice in the beautiful colors of fall as the leaves turn. And now with gratitude for these and every blessing we receive in life, for the gift of life itself, for the companionship of each other on our journey, for the beauty of our world, and for all the possibilities this and every day offers, let us raise our hearts in gladness and together say, Amen. Deep river, my home is over Jordan. Deep river, Lord, I want to cross over into campground. I didn't know very much about the Underground Railroad until I went to Cincinnati in March to visit the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center for the first time. The exhibits and displays of the Freedom Center tell the story of American slavery in the Underground Railroad. The building sits on the north bank of the Ohio River, a symbol of the promise of Ohio as a place for enslaved people to begin their journey to freedom. Ohio was the most active state in the Union for the Underground Railroad. Along the Ohio River and throughout our state, there were networks of people, free African Americans and white people, who worked together to help people escaping from slavery. There were conductors, people who guided and accompanying people fleeing slavery. Communities along the river and throughout the state provided food and hiding places that included private homes, churches, and schoolhouses. These were called stations, safe houses, and depots. The people operating them were called station masters. The people seeking freedom were passengers. Most underground railroad operators were farmers, business owners, ministers, townspeople who risked being arrested or killed to help people escape and get to Canada. Enslaved people went to Canada because of the Fugitive Slave Acts. The first act passed in 1793 allowed local governments to apprehend and extradite escaped enslaved people from within the borders of free states back to their point of origin and to punish anyone who helped the fugitives. Some northern states tried to combat this with personal liberty laws 
which were struck down by the Supreme Court in 1842. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 was designed to strengthen the previous law, which was felt by southern states to be inadequately enforced. The update created harsh penalties and set up a system of commissioners that promoted favoritism towards owners of enslaved people and led to some formerly enslaved people being recaptured. For an escaped person, the northern states were still considered a risk. The earliest mention of the Underground Railroad was in 1831 when enslaved man Tice Davids escaped from Kentucky into Ohio and his owner blamed an Underground Railroad for helping Davids to freedom. In 1839, a Washington newspaper reported an escaped enslaved man named Jim had revealed, under torture, his plan to go north following an Underground Railroad to Boston. Vigilance committees created to protect those who had escaped. People from bounty hunters in New York in 1835 and Philadelphia in 1838 soon expanded their activities to guide enslaved people on the run. By the 1840s, the term Underground Railroad was part of the American vernacular. My first visit to the Freedom Center was powerful and transforming. It was physically and emotionally painful to view the exhibits. I felt horror and anger and disbelief. Why was slavery ever allowed to happen? How can we be so cruel to each other? As I toured the displays, I also felt awe and gratitude for the many people who were part of the Underground Railroad, including two of the many Ohio heroes of the Underground Railroad, Reverend John Rankin, a Presbyterian minister who you heard about in the story, and John Parker, a free black man. Both of them lived in Ripley, Ohio, on the banks of the Ohio River. And incidentally, the River Jordan is code for the Ohio River. From Cincinnati, I drove east along the river to visit Ripley. I toured the homes of the Reverend John Rankin and John Parker. At Parker's home, a docent told us the story of John, a black man who bought his freedom and became not only a conductor on the Underground Railroad, but an extractor as well, someone who would go into Kentucky and lead people to Ohio. The John Parker Society in Ripley created a video about him, and I'd like you to watch that now. Borderlands, south of the Ohio, that's where the war was waged. Between the few houses that you see across the river and the few houses on this side of the Ohio, the midnight marauders is what we're called, those who were dared to go across the river looking for those who were trying to escape from that horrible, wretched institution of slavery. The real pain of slavery was not the pain of the body, but it was the pain of the soul. The taking away of a person's ability to think for himself or do for himself, that's the real tragedy of slavery. Ripley was known as the real hell hole of abolition. Many times I've had to walk down an alley with a pistol in one hand and a blackjack in the other. Many men would have leaped out of the alley just to grab the hold of it. The real fortress and home to the fugitive slaves was the house of the Reverend John Rankin, way up on top of the hill.
Would you join now in singing our hymn of longing number 153, Oh, I Woke Up This Morning. Oh, I woke up this morning with my mind and it was stayed on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind and it was stayed on freedom. I woke up this morning with my mind and it was stayed This reading is an excerpt from the Underground Railroad, <clears throat> excuse me, by William Still. William Still was an African-American abolitionist who frequently risked his life to help freedom seekers escape slavery. He participated directly in the escape of hundreds of African-Americans from Southern slavery. As secretary of the General Vigilance Committee, he conducted regular interviews with people who came through Philadelphia. In his 1872 book, The Underground Railroad, there is a consistent emphasis on the agency of the enslaved, on the power of individual African Americans to subvert and challenge the system that oppressed them, and to deny it final authority over their destinies. Here's some of their stories. Henry Box Brown, enslaved in Richmond, Virginia, convinced Samuel A. Smith to nail a box shut around him, wrap five hickory hoops around the box, and ship it to a member of the Vigilance Committee in Philadelphia. The box was two feet, eight inches wide, two feet deep, and three feet long. Even though the box was marked this side up with care, he spent some of the time upside down. There were tiny holes within the box so he could breathe. In all, the trip took 27 long hours. When the box finally arrived in the Philadelphia anti-slavery office, four people locked the door behind them, knocked on the box, and opened it up. Henry stood up and reached out to shake their hand. He was free. <laughs> Clarissa Davis tried to flee from Portsmouth, Virginia in May 1854 with two of her brothers. The brothers succeeded, but she was left behind. 
She sought a safe hiding place until an opportunity might come. After 75 days of hiding, word came to her that the steamship City of Richmond had arrived from Philadelphia and that the steward on board had consented to hide her this trip if she could manage to reach the ship safely. At the appointed hour of 3 p.m., dressed in male attire, Clarissa made her way and reached the boat safely where she was hidden in a box. She was safely delivered to the Vigilance Committee. Robert Brown, alias Thomas Jones, escaped from Martinsburg, Virginia in 1856. In order to do so, he had to swim the Potomac River on horseback on Christmas night. After crossing the river where it was about a half a mile wide in wet freezing cold, he rode all night a distance of about 40 miles. He then continued on foot, cold and hungry, until he arrived at Harrisburg where he found friends. He arrived in Philadelphia on New Year's night, 1857. Harriet Tubman was a woman of no pretensions, yet in point of courage, shrewdness, and exertions she, to rescue others, she was without equal. Time and time again, she made successful visits to Maryland on the Underground Railroad, running daily risks while making preparations for herself and her passengers. Later, she would say, I was a conductor of the Underground Railroad for eight years, and I can say what most conductors cannot say. I never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. At the top of 100 steps on Liberty Hill, 300 feet above the Ohio River, is the home of the Reverend John Rankin in Ripley. You learned about him in our time for all ages. If you were a freedom seeker who climbed those 100 steps to his home, you'd have a safe place to hide before continuing your journey. Rankin, his wife Jean, and their 13 children gave shelter and food to at least 2,000 people fleeing slavery during his career with the Underground Railroad. Harriet Beecher Stowe immortalized Rankin's efforts to help African Americans in her book, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Rankin's home was the first stop in Ohio for Eliza, one of the book's main characters that she sought freedom. I also discovered that Rankin has an interesting tie to Unitarian Universalism. In 1841, he wrote a book titled, An Antidote to Unitarianism. <laughs> <laughs> Reverend Rankin and his wife Jean are buried in Ripley's Cemetery, and along with their names, the gravestone says, Freedom's Heroes. But let's return to Kent. The town of Franklin Mills, now Kent, was active in the Underground Railroad. Many residents aided people in their flight north toward Canada. In 1825, at their tavern on Manaway Street, Joshua and Rebecca Woodard gave shelter to a group of six people, including a woman named Mrs. Hurst and her infant. The freedom seekers had followed the drinking gourd, a code referring to the Big Dipper. They left the baby with the Woodards, who adopted the child. The Woodards' son, James, took the other people to Cleveland by wagon. Along the road, they encountered two bounty hunters. James hushed his nervous travel companions and ordered them to be very still. He whistled nonchalantly as the hunters approached, one on each side of the wagon. When questioned about his load, James said he was carrying produce to the Cleveland market. The bounty hunters believed the story, perhaps distracted because they were hungry, and ironically, they rode off for Woodard's Tavern, the closest place to eat. I visited the National Underground Railroad Freedom Center twice more since my first visit. It was one of my topics during study leave this summer. There's so much more to learn about the Underground Railroad and lots of Ohio sites to visit. I'm fascinated and inspired by the Underground Railroad. It's many stir stories of the courage of people, especially free African Americans, who are willing to risk their lives and their own freedom 
to help thousands of people escape slavery. The power of ordinary people working together to defy injustice and oppression. The Underground Railroad is also an invitation to continue the work of freedom, which is not finished. People of color in this country still face hatred, racism, discrimination, and injustice. There is still work to do to heal the wounds of slavery, to honor and celebrate the contributions of people of color, to make reparations for the centuries of loss, injustice, and oppression they have experienced, and to dismantle systems of white supremacy in our culture. As Unitarian Universalists, our values and our principles call us to keep doing this work. Our denomination, the Unitarian Universalist Association, has struggled through its history with the effects of racism and white supremacy culture on our institutional structures and systems. The proposed eighth principle we read for the chalice lighting needs to be affirmed so that we have a vision for living up to the aspirations of Unitarian Universalism as a truly free, inclusive faith. As a congregation, we've made a commitment to uphold our values of justice, equity, and compassion that call us to recognize the worth and dignity of every person and to bold action in ending systemic racism through uniting in witness, speaking courageously, advocating for institutional change, and participating in community action. I hope we will not only continue this work, but invite others to join us. The Underground Railroad offers us a vision of a future of freedom, of justice, of equality, of a nation and a world where beloved community is a reality. Let's ride that freedom train together toward glory, shall we? May it be so, and together we will make it so. Let's take a moment for silent reflection. we were able to do the work we do together as a spiritual community. As each of us participates in the circle of giving and receiving, thanks to your generous gifts of money, time and care for each other, and recognize that we are truly all connected. Thank you. We also work to help others in our community thrive, so we give to agencies and organizations in Kent and beyond that serve those in need. In October, our special offering is for the Akron Canton Regional Food Bank. It provides food and other essential items to member hunger relief programs that operate more than 600 food pantries, hot meal sites, shelters, and other hunger relief programs in neighbors, neighborhoods and communities where people need food. In the spirit of gratitude for the gift of one another in this community and the abundance that makes our generosity possible, we now give and receive the offering as a sign of our shared commitment to the work and life of this congregation and beyond. Would the ushers please come forward? Do what I can, when I can, while I can for my people. 
Thank you to the OK Corral. <laughs> <laughs> Primo. Now to bring our time of worship to its close, would you join me in extinguishing the chalice? We extinguish this flame, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. May we carry these in our hearts and in our minds together again. And now as the Spirit moves you, would you rise and join in singing our closing hymn, This Train is Bound for Glory. This train is bound for glory, this train, this train. This train is bound for justice, this train. This train is bound for justice, this train. This train is bound for justice, no Jim Crow or discrimination. This train is bound for justice, this train. This train is bound for freedom, this train. This train is bound for equality, this train. This train is bound for equality, this train. This train is bound for equality, there's inclusion and diversity. This train is bound for glory, this train. This train is bound for glory, this train. couple of reminders for you. Please do not exit the building through Fessenden Hall where our children are having religious education classes. Next Sunday service will be led by our Kent Hogwarts team and will be in Hobbs Hall. So usual time, 11 o'clock, but please join the Hogwarts, Kent Hogwarts team next week. And I offer you these words of Harriet Tubman. I had reasoned this out in my mind. There was one of two things I had a right to, liberty or death. If I could not have one, I would have the other. God's time is always near. He set the North Star in the heavens. He gave me the strength in my limbs. He meant I should be free. Now that I've been free, I know what a dreadful condition slavery is. I have heard their groans and sighs and seen their tears, and I would give every drop of blood in my veins to free them. Now, as our journey on the freedom train continues, our work of ending racism and discrimination and injustice in our world, let us go forth in hope and in faith to continue inspiring love, seeking justice, and growing together in community. May it be so. Blessed be. Amen. And I see the light in you.